Innovation in the alternative protein industry has boomed over the last five years. From plant-based to lab-grown meat, there's a whole host of solutions coming to market that offer more sustainable options to traditionally produced meat. But at this critical point for the planet, how can we convince the masses to put down the steak and opt to one of these new protein sources? Does it all come down to taste and texture? Is it just about cost and convenience? Will we ever be able to give up the romance of a good Sunday roast or the prospect of a meaty burger? I'm Matt Eastland and welcome to the Food Fight podcast from EIT Food, exploring the greatest challenges facing the food system and the innovations and entrepreneurs looking to solve them. Our first guest is the author of Clean Meat, How Growing Meat Without Animals Will Revolutionise Dinner and the World. He's also the CEO of the Better Meat Co., a company working on microprotein superfoods. A very warm welcome to Paul Shapiro. Thanks so much, Matt. Great to be with you. Great to have you too. Thanks very much. And also joining us today from Germany is food entrepreneur and biologist Alison Stiller. Alison is co-founder and CEO of Wilding Foods, a company applying science to nature to grow a very special type of mushroom known as the chicken of the woods. Wilding Foods are also part of the EIT Food Accelerator Network. Welcome to the show, Alison. Very excited to be here. Hi. Great stuff. Great to have you. Just to kind of set the context for our listeners, so the size of the global plant-based meat market is estimated to be over, what, about 3 billion in 2019, and that's going to continue to grow, I think, forecast around like 13 billion by 2027. So that's quite an impressive year-on-year growth rate of, what, about 20%, which is great news, but it's still small relative to the global meat market. So I think that one of the studies I've looked at estimated was worth over $800 billion in 2020, and it's set to rise to well over a trillion dollars by 2025. So quite a big difference. With those stats in mind, I guess my first kind of big opening question for you both In your own words, why is it so important that we shift towards meat-free now? Alison, maybe if we can start with you. I think people are ready. People are ready also because they focus more on eating healthily and they focus more on eating naturally as well. So it's not only about the meat, it's also about really focusing on your health. And that's something that we should take into account when we think about the shift from meat to meat alternatives. Because people are ready to eat healthily, they're also more ready to skip the meat. That's just one aspect. The other aspect is, of course, that there are more and more grueling reports about animal cruelty. And it is just more and more clear because of climate change as well that we have to find a different way of living. Great. Got it. Thank you. And and Paul, do you think people are ready for this now? I do, Matt, and I'm in concert with, with with what Allison just said. And just to supplement her very final point, I think it's important to remember the planet is not getting any bigger. Humanity's footprint on the planet is getting a lot bigger, but the planet itself isn't getting any bigger. And you know, we already have nearly eight billion of us walking around on the planet today. And by 2050, we're going to add another couple billion more people, presuming there's no catastrophe that strikes before them. So, how are we going to feed all of these incoming billions of people, many of whom want to eat meat? We all know already that it just takes a a lot of land, a lot of water, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, a lot of animal cruelty, as Allison mentioned, to raise and slaughter all these billions of animals for food. And it's just a really, really resource intensive way to produce food for humanity. The problem is that even though you're right, Matt, that demand for plant-based is increasing, demand for meat is also increasing, both on a volume basis and on a per-person basis. And so we have to find a way that satisfies the meat tooth that people have, so to speak, without raising and slaughtering animals. It's kind of like, you know, we have to find a way to provide us, let's say, with light that we can flip a switch in the room and lights comes on. Well, we want that light, but we don't want it to come from fossil fuels, right? We want it to come from renewables. Well, people want meat just like they want a lit room, but they don't necessarily want animals to be slaughtered for it. And so if we can create meat-like experiences without the need to raise and slaughter animals, it'll be better for everybody, both those animals and humanity at the same time. Do you think then up until now that the main challenge for the alternative protein industry is that it's struggled to make anything that's been genuinely tasty enough or as tasty as meat? I mean, is that the kind of key critical challenge that the alternative protein industry has to overcome? 
Okay, yeah, the short answer is yes. So, you know, for a long time, for decades, in fact, the alt meat industry was really trying to create foods that were almost like a consolation prize for vegetarians, right? So you go to the barbecue and they don't have anything for you, so they throw this on. And it's good. It's good for vegetarians. That's great. But until the last five or so years, you haven't really seen products that are intended for carnivores, for people who really want the exact experience of eating meat without necessarily all of the baggage associated with it, whether it's the high saturated fat and cholesterol, the animal cruelty, cruelty, the greenhouse gas emissions, and more. And so increasingly, what we have seen is a shift in the alternative protein sector to go from producing foods that are, you know, they taste good and they're cool, but now to one where the foods actually are mimicking meat. It's kind of like if you imagine the difference between, let's say, electric cars, right? You know, in the past, they were not as good as regular internal combustion engine cars. You know, they had a short distance that they could drive, all these other problems. But as soon as you get to a place where they actually are equal or better in performance than internal combustion cars, and you can get them to be cost parity, that's the real game changer. So one problem, Matt, has been what you identified with this uh, textural issue. The other is price, that even today, plant-based meats are still sold at prices that are substantially higher than conventional animal-based meats. And so I think that the industry has made a lot of progress on the taste and textural issue. And it's making progress on the price issue, but there still is some way to go before plant-based meat becomes cost competitive with conventional meat from slaughtered animals. Okay, that's really useful. And thank you both for sort of just setting the context. You know, Paul, just staying with you, I mean, I'm really interested in both of your backstories. And one of the things you picked up on is the fact about this cost parity and the fact also that you know, it's getting to that stage where the taste, the texture, it's starting to reach that parity as well. And you've done some really amazing work in this space. And I think people will most likely have heard of your book before. But just going to your backstory. So where did all of this interest in alternative protein start? And what led you to work at the Better Meat Co.? Well, that's very kind of you, Matt. In short, I long have been concerned about both the treatment of the animals who are raising for food, which is typically quite deplorable. Most people don't want to think about it with good reason. It's very depressing. So I won't enumerate the long list of horrible things that we do to farm animals. But suffice it to say that, you know, we treat farm animals in ways that we would never allow the most heinous criminals in our society to be treated. Yet these animals haven't committed any crime at all. So I have long been concerned about that. And I have been concerned about climate change and what humanity is doing to the rest of the planet. We're causing mass extinction. We're raising the forests. We are creating huge problems for ourselves and nearly every other species on the planet. And a lot of that is due to how we feed ourselves, uh, principally in the amount of meat that we eat. So I have long been concerned about this. The problem is that really raising awareness about these problems is generally insufficient to change people's behavior. It is not the case that once people just know the facts that they will change. Most of the time, facts are not what change people's behavior. And what we really need is technology that can render the archaic system totally obsolete. So if you think about, for example, Matt, what happened with whaling, where, you know, if this had been 150 years, years ago, we would be lighting our homes with whale oil. And there were lots of concerns in the 19th century about the treatment of whales. People were concerned that we we're going to render them extinct. And it wasn't humane sentiment or sustainability concerns that freed whales from harpoons. It was the invention of kerosene, which rendered whaling obsolete because kerosene was a cheaper, more efficient way to light our homes. You know, similarly, you know, we didn't stop whipping horses to transport us around because we cared about horses. We stopped because cars were invented and that liberated horses. We didn't stop live plucking geese for their quills to write letters with because we cared about geese, we stopped because fountain pens were invented. And the list goes on and on, right? There's just technological advance after technological advance, which renders animal exploitation obsolete. And I think that is the same as what is going to happen in the animal agriculture space, where in the same way that we used to, let's say, print photographs to capture our memories, now we have the same thing. We still capture our memories as we just do it digitally in a far more efficient way. And I think that in the same way we used to slaughter animals for meat, we'll now have a more efficient way to get that meat experience without having to raise and slaughter animals. That's why I wrote the book, Clean Meat, as you kindly mentioned earlier. And that's why I started The Better Meat Co., because I am adamant about trying to create this clean protein industry where we can sustainably feed humanity into the future without having to inflict so much suffering on so many other species across the globe. You talk about innovation, and I love that perspective that it's actually the, it's innovation and technology that's effectively replacing these things and providing better alternatives. So then of all the options that you had to go for within the alternative protein space, 
why microprotein? And, you know, maybe you can give our listeners a bit of an explanation about what microprotein is and particularly your riser product that you sell. Sure. I'm very excited about it. So, you know, one of the things that plant-based meat has in common is that it's made from plants, right? The top three crops that it's made from are wheat, pea, or soy, typically, or some combination of those three crops. And those are all good, but the problem with them is that they're plants. And you're trying to make plants taste like animals. And that's a far jump because evolutionarily, those two kingdoms are very far apart, plants and animals. So you have to do a lot to those plants to turn them into things that look like animal meat. However, there is a third kingdom, fungi. And fungi are not directly in the middle of plants and animals. They are far closer to animals than they are to plants. In fact, just like animals, the fungi breathe in oxygen and breathe out CO2, which we know plants do the opposite. Just like Animals, fungi have to search out their food and digest it and consume it, unlike plants, which just put themselves in the sun and photosynthesize. So these are just two examples of how much closer fungi are to animals than they are to plants. And that's relevant because it explains why mushrooms tend to have a much meatier texture than plants. In fact, mushrooms have been used as a meat substitute in Asian cuisine for centuries. The problem is that mushrooms aren't that high in protein. However, the mycelium or the uh, root-like structure underneath the mushroom often is not only meat-like in its texture, but also high in protein. And so what we at The Better Meat Co. are doing is subjecting mycelium, which again is these like fungi roots, to a special kind of fermentation where we essentially feed them potatoes. And they, just like a cow eats grass and converts it into a steak, our little microscopic fungi consume potatoes and convert it into a high-protein meat-like food. But unlike a cow, which takes more than a year of feeding her before you slaughter her, with our little microscopic fungi, we harvest them within less than one day. So you put them in the fermenter, they consume the potatoes, less than a day later, you have this river of mycoprotein, and that is a delicious succulent product that we call Ryza that is higher in protein than eggs, higher in iron than beef, and it naturally contains vitamin B12 because it's the product of a microbial fermentation. It's a whole food, it's not genetically modified, and it's absolutely delicious. And you can make steaks and chicken cutlets and crab cakes and fish sticks and more, all with a very tiny little fraction of the resources that you need to raise and slaughter animals. Wow. Okay. I am loving this. I have learned so much in the last three minutes. Thank you for that. And from one from one type of fungi to another, let's go like that. I mean, Alison, thanks for waiting patiently there. So to talk about Walding, just to pull out a bold quote, which is directly from your own homepage, you say that meat alternatives are highly processed and artificial or bland and boring or just not quite right. So are these conclusions what inspired you to enter the alternative meat industry? How did this all happen for you? <laughs> the backstory behind our aim to produce chicken of the woods is actually quite funny. We were a group of students at a party in Switzerland and the next day we were hanging out in the garden. We looked up and on the plum tree behind us was a huge, bright yellow, very impressive mushroom. We happened to have a mushroom enthusiast with us who knew this was chicken of the woods and you can eat it. I was very sceptical. I said, I'm not eating this. This doesn't look edible at all. But we did fry it up. And when I did eat it, I was hooked immediately. I have never eaten a mushroom before that was so fibrous and so like chicken. And I immediately understood why this was called chicken of the woods. So since we were all biologists and biotechnologists, we thought... Why can't we buy this? And if we can't buy this, can we make it? Well, it turns out, no, you can't buy it because no one makes it. No one has made it before. So we set out to change that. And after two years of many, many setbacks, many mushroom failures in our cellar, in our garage, we did manage to produce it. So at the moment, we are producing small amounts of chicken of the woods mushroom and we are patenting that production process at the moment. And that's the backstory of how we ended up doing this. <laughs> Amazing. I can't imagine you're just a student and suddenly somebody convinces you just to grab a mushroom off a tree and give it a go. That is uh, experimental. I love it. I love it. And how did you go from, let's say, finding or foraging this mushroom chicken in the woods to be able to grow it in a commercial way? So where do you have to start with that? 
we looked into literature, saw if there's only one, anything there, and we collected spores and we collected strains of lots of different mushrooms that we could find. Because this mushroom does grow all over the world, but it's very rare. But if you happen to find one, send a sample to me, please, and I'll harvest it and uh, I'll put it in the lab. First, we had to set up a sterile environment because the mushroom is very prone to contamination. So we found everything you need in a lab and we collaborated with a university. We got selected for a nationwide big grant, which funded us for a year. Got another grant after that, which funded us for another year. Won a few prizes. Prize money gave us money again. And slowly we became a proper company and we've been incorporated since spring 2020. Corona was a big setback for us as well, but now we are all set. Huge, congrats, I love it. What a sort of growth journey that you've been on. And just for our listeners then, for people who aren't familiar with Chicken in the Woods, and I have to say, I do know it, I haven't tasted it yet, but my my uncle, he owns his own forest and he's always telling me that he has it there. So when I go up there next, I'll grab a bit and I'll send it to you. you Why do you think Chicken in the Wood kind of trumps other like processed meat products? You know, what's so special about it? What is it the taste? Is it the texture? Is it all of those things? Yeah, all of those things. So um, Paul mentioned before that fungi fruiting bodies, so what we generally call mushrooms, often don't have a lot of protein. That is not true for this mushroom. It has about 20% of protein in its fruiting body when we produce it. And the difference to other alternative meats is we don't have to do anything. We make a mushroom, we harvest the fruiting bodies, and you cut them into pieces. Then you have beautiful chicken-like fillets. The mushroom grows up to be five kilograms or more, so it's very big. You can really cut out escalopes. You can cut out whole chunks that you can use as a basis for all sort of meaty dishes. It's fibrous. It has a very strong umami taste. You can process it just like chicken. And you don't have to do anything to achieve this. You don't have to use some kind of very technical process. It's just mushroom growing just that no one has done it before. Amazing. And you don't, just in terms of the, the actual end product itself, do you have to do anything else to it? So, or do you just, I say just, I know there's an awful lot of tech and effort that's gone into this, but do you grow it and then you can just slice it and package it up and sell it? Is that how it works? Yeah, that's our main idea. So we would slice it and sell it as it is because that's really the main advantage of this mushroom over other mushrooms. You don't have to chop it up. But you can, of course, spice it some more. You can use it for Chinese chicken dishes. Then you can use some soy sauce to flavor it. But you don't have to. You can just salt it and fry it and that's it. Wow. I can't wait to try some. Paul, have you had the privilege of trying chicken of the forest? I'm honored to say that I have tried it, but I am totally blown away, Allison, by what you're doing because I actually have talked with a number of people about this for years, even long before I started the Better Miko, about somebody trying to find a way to commercially produce chicken of the woods. And I have not really looked into it myself, but I just presumed it was prohibitive because it's so rare in nature that how are you going to find a way to actually commercialize and produce large quantities of it? So I'm intrigued by what you're doing and I cannot wait till your products become available in the United States because I will become an eager consumer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, me too. Definitely. I think you've, you've got some very sort of tipped caps there too, Alison, you know, really well done on that. And Paul, you know, going back to your rhizomycer protein, you mentioned that, as you say, that it's a superfood in every sense of the word. And I guess if it does have more protein than eggs, more fiber than oats, more iron than pork, chicken, turkey, or even beef, as you say, why has this never been done before? If it's that nutritious, that sustainable, that flavorsome, why is it that this is only becoming like really commercial now? What's held it back? Well, there is one example of a company commercializing a different species of mycoprotein, and, and that is, of course, corn, Q-U-O-R-N, in the UK. Their products are available in the US, but most of their business is in Europe. They're doing something that's uh, somewhat similar. It's a different species. So if you, know, if you think about plant-based meat, it, you know, like I said, it's either wheat, pea, or soy. Well, in the fungi kingdom, there's thousands and thousands of species of fungi, and almost none of them have been studied for their uses as potential meat replacements. But corn is the shining example of a company that's really been 
built on this type of fungi fermentation to create something that, frankly, I don't really think it tastes like meat, but I think it tastes very good. Like to me, corn tastes like a novel category of food that I enjoy eating and I really admire their company a lot, but it's not a meat mimicry to me at least. And so that's what we're trying to do is use a different species of fungi, in fact, a different genus altogether, and get a more meat-like texture and a more meat-like product from it. And so that's the real goal is, you know, we admire what corn has accomplished, but we want to become something that's using mycelium to actually mimic meat and do it in a whole food nutritious way. So our mycoprotein is about 43% protein. And it is not only a whole food, but it also, it has more fiber, as you say, Matt, than oats. And it's important to remember you know, pretty much nobody listening to this episode is protein deficient, right? Like everybody is looking for how many grams of protein are in their food, but nobody's protein deficient. In fact, nearly all everybody listening to this gets more protein than they actually need according to the recommended daily allowance of various governments. However, virtually everybody listening to this podcast is fiber deficient, right? So nine out of 10 Americans, and uh, I would imagine the same as so in Britain, don't get enough fiber. And fiber deficiency is important not just to prevent things like constipation, but also really serious ailments like uh, colon cancer and otherwise. And so, yes, our mycoprotein has the protein that you want, but it has the fiber that you need. And that is one of the things I think is so important to recognize because when you're dealing with a whole food in the plant or the fungi kingdom, you're going to get both that protein and the fiber as opposed to something that's just, let's say, like a protein isolate or like meat, which has no fiber at all. So, you know, there is no fiber in meat because animals have skeletons. That's what holds them up. Plants don't have skeletons. What holds them up is fiber. So the reason you get fiber in plants is because they have to stand up somehow and they don't have skeletons. But that fiber is really critical, is a ubiquitous deficiency throughout the Western world where we don't eat enough plants. And that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about the potential for fungi to really uh, take some of the meat demand and put it into the fungi kingdom because that way you really can improve on the fiber deficiency issues that are plaguing our society. Thanks, Paul. I mean, that's a really important point. And actually, we've had people on the show before talking about alternative proteins. And, you know, everybody in this space always says, you know, we're not protein deficient. We are sort of socially, culturally fixated, it seems now, on getting more and more protein, which, of course, is super important for a balanced diet. But to your point that, yeah, fiber just seems to have been forgotten along the way. So thanks for underlining that. And one of the other things that I've I kind of noticed about your product and, and the way that you sell this is that you kind of offer like blends or you the way you combine this or you offer it as a formula, I think, that you say. And do you do that because you think that this is like a necessary step or you are you just trying to make meat products more sustainable? So what's the reasoning behind the sort of the blending approach? Sure. So you can use better meat co ingredients to make fully animal free meats. However, we also sell them to meat companies for them to blend our proteins into their meat so that they can reduce their footprint on the planet and make healthier products. So, for example, if you've heard of a company called Purdue Farms, it's a major chicken company in the United States, and they do a product that's called Purdue Chicken Plus. It's 50% chicken, 50% plant-based. And that product looks and tastes just like a regular chicken nugget. In fact, the Food Network named it the best-tasting frozen chicken nugget in America, despite the fact that it's just 50% chicken chicken. And it has less saturated fat than a regular chicken nugget, less cholesterol, fewer calories, has actual vegetable content in there. So for every serving of nuggets your kids eat, you're getting a quarter cup of vegetables. And so you really can see how sustainability and public health can be intertwined here. And you know people are getting the products that they want and that they love, like these chicken nuggets, except they have a lower footprint on the planet and a better health outcome for themselves. Now, of course, I would love for more people just to eat bean and rice burritos and lentil soup and hummus and all these other great foods. But, you know, I I keep it real. Like, we got to play the cards as they're dealt. And meat demand is going up, as I mentioned earlier. It's going up, not down. And so in the same way that I wish that, you know, we would not be using fossil fuels, if people are driving internal combustion engine cars, I would really like to make sure that those cars have high fuel efficiency, right? So you improve on the mileage per gallon so that those cars use less fossil fuels. I think the same is so with meat, that the meat companies themselves can hybridize their products products create something that is the same, if not better, experience from a sensory perspective for their customers, but that's better for the world and better for their health. Okay, great. Thank you. And just picking up on your point about kind of keeping it real, I mean, Alison, do you, do you agree? Do you think that it makes sense to be able to 
transition like this i mean i I know that chicken in the woods you you say that you're trying to sell it as a kind of like a whole product but what's your view do you think that actually once people taste a product like yours they're just going to say you know what i don't need meat at all this is going to be it for me it depends from which angle you look at it so i agree with paul that in order to convince everyone to get off meat, we have to make taste better and we have to improve structure as well, for sure. And making meat blends where only 50% has to be meat is a brilliant idea as well. We come from a little bit of a different angle. So yes, to answer your question in short, yes, I think if people eat the good pieces of the chicken of the woods mushroom, they won't miss chicken because it's so like chicken. But not so yes but i don't know whether it'll be possible to make chicken of the woods as cheap as the cheapest chicken you can buy so we are very clear in this as well we're not trying to convince people who spend two euros on a kilogram of chicken in a supermarket because we won't get to these people i don't think we will because it's still expensive to produce chicken of the woods fungi fruiting bodies I'm not sure whether that might change in a way that we really get every flexitarian in the world, but we will get everyone who wants high quality meat alternative, who wants something that is clean. And that's also something where we set ourselves apart from other meat alternatives, which mimic meat, but they're not healthy in any way. There are a lot of burgers in the market at the moment, and while they are raved about because they taste like meat they are not healthy products at all this is where we differ so we do something a little bit similar to better meat co as well we do have lots of other meat alternatives based on fermentation where we use other mushroom strains and like better meat we use the root part so the mycelium part of the mushroom but what we do different is we don't use fermentation tanks but we have an edible high quality highly nutritious substrate that we then use for the mycelium part that sort of grows through and then we use the whole thing so you eat the grains that we use plus the mycelium around it and that way we also have something that doesn't exactly mimic meat but it's a very umami experience and it's very 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 clean it has lots of fiber lots of protein and there's nothing technical nothing highly processed about it it's basically whole food and i think that you need both in order to convince everyone you need you need products that are artificial that really try everything to mimic meat to get the people who just want meat no matter what no matter what was done to the animal but you also need high quality whole food approaches to get people who care about the health of their food i think the health aspect So do you think then that, I mean, I was going to talk just very briefly about that kind of health aspect, but do you think that a lot of alternative plant burgers, which are heavily processed, do you think that does then come down to the fact that it's just cheaper to do and actually a product like yours, for example, the chicken of the woods, it it needs to be more premium and people need to understand that they have to pay more money for to have that kind of super clean premium experience for a product like that? At the moment, yes, of course, that might change in the future. But if you look at premium mushrooms, they are more expensive than meat, full stop. And I don't see that changing extremely quickly. But again, I don't think it has to change extremely quickly either. Okay, great. Thank you. And I'm glad we started to talk about sort of scale and, you know, because this is one of the areas which people are always super interested in about how far this will go. And also what this is going to do to like traditional agriculture. And I'd be very interested to get both of your opinions on how the balance, if there is going to be one, is going to be uh, sort of seen. So do you see the state of traditional farming changing as alternative proteins, you know, continue to, you know, meet more and more consumer demand? So, Paul, in your book, you say, eat meat, not animals, for example. You know, will the meat farming industry be eclipsed, do you think? Or is there a way of finding a, a some kind of harmony, if at all? 
Oh, Matt, uh, I'm honored that you read the book and that you know that line. I'm, I'm proud to say that one reader of the book, uh, Queen Meat, actually printed a T-shirt with that quote on it. It said, eat meat, not animals. And I was so proud to see that. So, yeah, that. I mean, look, people still are going to eat, right? So, you know, even uh, what Allison is doing is still requires cultivation. What we're doing at Better Meat Co., I mentioned, you know, we feed potatoes to our microscopic fungi. Somebody's got to grow those potatoes. Like, there still are going to be people producing food. It's just going to be in a far more efficient and less destructive manner for the planet. Interestingly, in the United States, when tobacco consumption started declining because people were smoking less, not causally correlated, but there was a correlation with increased hummus demand. A little interesting thing in the shift in society, people eating more hummus and smoking less, eating more hummus and a real shift in in the times. (laughs) There's Um, a a t-shirt slogan right there too. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, eat eat hummus, not cigarettes. So uh, anyway, (laughs) you know, the point is that there were programs that helped a lot of the tobacco growers switch from growing tobacco plants to growing chickpea plants. And that was a pretty interesting shift in the economy, just in the same way that, you know, to go back to my film analogy earlier, you know, we had this entire film industry based on producing negatives and all the chemicals and the dark rooms and everything else you needed to make print photographs. And we still have a photography industry. It's just a digital photography industry with different types of skill sets needed, but there still are people working in this industry. I do think that there will be, because it's so much more efficient not to raise and slaughter animals, I do think that you will have some sectors that lose out and others that win out. But, you know, I'll put it this way, you know, how many people when they're streaming something on Netflix are shedding a tear for the Blockbuster and other video store employees who are no longer working at those stores because we're streaming rather than going to video stores. This is just the way that the economy works. New industries displace old industries because of innovation and entrepreneurship, whether that's in the film industry or in the video consumption industry or next in the meat industry. I really think that we have to recognize that this is a doomsday course that we are on right now, raising and slaughtering billions of animals. It increases pandemic risk. It increases antibiotic resistance. It increases climate changing emissions. And we just can't keep going down this course. And so, yes, it will restructure the economy to divorce meat production from livestock slaughter. But it will be for the good, and the people who are working in agriculture will just be producing other things. That's just the, the way that it'll work in the same way in these other examples that we were just talking about happened as well. And Alison, I'm going to assume that you agree with Paul on this one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with Paul. I think farmers are often depicted as um, being very conservative, which might often be the case, but I know personally that the farming industry is undergoing a lot of change as well. And I know that many farmers are looking to not only branching out, but also to just grabbing opportunities to do innovative stuff. I know that farmers in Germany, at least, are um, very into the idea of having fermentation tanks on their property, for example, and that they're very ready to partner up with other companies to produce alternatives for meat. And we, of course, have also been personally approached by not only companies in the alternative industry, but also by really traditional chicken farming companies. Is that right? How interesting. Absolutely. So farmers and companies that work together with them are not only aware that there's a change and that they have to adapt, but they also want to. They also want to be a part of this innovative time. Well, that's really positive to know that the more traditional industries are already looking to to the future and to, well, I, like you say, that <laughs> I think they probably know which way this is all going so that they're trying desperately to innovate now. I think that's really encouraging. And, you know, just thinking about the future then a little bit. So, I think we've all heard that the demand for alternative protein products like yours is going to continue to grow. But how fast, in your view, is this space going to change? And if we did want to accelerate that pace, how do we go about getting more consumers to embrace these products? Or is it even the consumers that we need to convince? So what does the future look like? And you know, how do we get there most quickly? Alison, what do you think? This is a question that not only concerns the view of the consumer, but it also very much concerns legal issues. Because Paul, for example, is based in the US, of course, it's in a very different environment than I am. 
I don't know if you're aware of this, but the novel food law in Europe is very strict. I've had conversations about this with other company owners in the US who also work with mushroom mycelium, and they didn't really realize how difficult it would be for them, for example, to branch out the European market. Because in Europe, just to um, clarify this for the, the listener, if your product hasn't been consumed sort of before the 90s, then it is considered novel food, which means it is new, which means it is not clear that you can eat it. <laughs> and that, again, for a company is a big issue because you have to pay a lot of money to conduct studies that prove that your product is safe. This is a bit different from the grass status in the US because not only do you have to prove it's safe through, for example, an argument that you argue that is similar to other foods. No, you really have to conduct studies. And if you're lucky, you have to conduct studies with animals and with humans over years and years and years, and it can cost you millions. So right. wow. there's a big movement to challenge those novel food laws to make it easier for companies to introduce new products. And we are, for example, extremely lucky because while no one has produced chicken of the woods, there is proof that it has been sold on farmers markets. So, I was just going to ask yeah. that. So does does that mean you fall into this or not? Apparently not, which is no, great we news. don't we don't. And as for the fermentation, the mushroom mycelium that we use, we use traditional Japanese mushroom strains that are also luckily <laughs> have been available in the form of very different products in throughout Europe. So we're in the clear for those as well. But it's a very sensitive issue and I'm also part of different groups where people try and change that. That's one important aspect. The other important aspect on the legal side is declaration and naming of products. I talked to another mushroom grower in the US recently and he also thought that the US was restrictive environment but compared to Germany it's not at all because in Germany, I don't know if you know this, we're not allowed to call plant-based milk milk it has to be called drink there's no soy milk it's a soy drink <laughs> there yeah, is no I, I was aware of that and i know yeah. that they they were trying to in- introduce uh something into legislation about this weren't there but i think that got dropped european wide but i know that germany's laws are much much stricter it's very strict you're not even really allowed to call a vegan schnitzels or escalope schnitzel because you know consumers might be fooled into thinking they're eating meat while they're not which is of course really it's a bit ridiculous to be honest and also it makes it hard I think for companies to introduce new kinds of meat alternatives. As for the consumer I think the change is here. I don't think we have to talk about how fast it's going to happen. It is happening. If you think about the hype that was made around the first (laughs) <laughs> big alternative burger patty from the US. I'm not going to name anything here, but you all know what I mean. We do. That That's not that long ago. And in all supermarkets here, we now have lots and lots and lots of different varieties, and they all are very similar to, to this burger that was introduced. That was the first soy-free burger patty, I believe. I'm not entirely sure. And now there are lots of soy-free burger patties. And um, it's more common to buy meat alternatives. And I think what Paul mentioned earlier is a sort of sorry excuse for meat for a vegetarian. Here you have something that you can put on your barbecue. I think that's gone. Mm. There are real good meat alternatives on the market now in all different sectors. So the change has happened. It is here. Okay, great. So Alison thinks the change is here and it's now. I mean, Paul, if that's the case, how do we accelerate it further? Well, I think it's important to have something different happen than what happened with clean energy. Because if you look, for example, right now, you know, the United States is importing the vast majority of our solar panels and our lithium ion batteries and Asia beat us to the punch because governments like in China incentivized their own economies to produce these. They subsidized it. They encouraged it. Whereas, you know, we're over here still subsidizing fossil fuels, right? And the same is so with animal agriculture. The amount of subsidies and other governmental supports that are lavishly bestowed upon the animal agriculture sector are absolutely astounding. And we have not really seen much governmental investment into the R&D to take what companies like the Better Mico or what Allison are doing and to bring it to commercial scale, yet that's exactly what we need. Sure, we should be investing more in solar and wind and geothermal and more, but we also should be investing more 
in things like animal-free protein technologies. And so we've started to see this happen in the U.S. where our National Science Foundation, which is a governmental body, did award a $3.5 million grant to a university here called UC Davis in California to study cultivated meat. So that's different from what Allison and I are doing. It's That's real meat grown from real animal cells and, mm. and just grown without the animal. But that's like really one of the first governmental grants to an, an academic institution to try to advance this field. And we need direct support of the startups and the entrepreneurs in this space who are trying to create new innovations. You don't want to leave this solely to the realm of entrepreneurs who are going around to venture capitalists trying to get them to invest in the space. We really should have some government funding of this. And I think that's the best way to accelerate it because the two areas that we were talking about earlier, making it taste really phenomenal and making it as cheap as meat is, are not going to happen without major R&D efforts. And we're talking – huge capital expenses here. And so if we want to save humanity from ourselves and what we are doing to the planet, we're going to have to make investments. And those are going to, they should be coming from public dollars to help create an animal-free protein industry that can compete on taste and on price. Thank you. And that is exactly why we have the likes of EIT Food, because that's exactly what we're trying to do. Shameless plug, shameless plug. But uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks for that. Just last couple of questions because we're, we're really nearly out of time. But again, staying with this sort of future theme or maybe there's something you've seen right now, is there anything really exciting other than your products, of course, that you've seen in this space that you really would like to kind of highlight that you want to know more about? Paul, what do you think? Uh, I'm only excited by Allison's work and my own work. Nobody else's. Uh, no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> I... I, I yeah, well, I mean, just to go back to corn, I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm going to give an answer aside from corn, but the fact that corn has created a really viable, successful, profitable business uh, using fungi to create a, a high protein food is, I think, a, a great guidepost for the rest of us in this industry to show that it can be done. So my hats off to them. But yeah, there are quite a lot of things that are happening in this space that I am particularly enthusiastic about, and in particular, I'm excited to see other companies that are exploring the fungi world. World. So as an example, Aquacultured Foods is in Chicago by a, an entrepreneur named Ann Palermo, and they are using solid state fungi fermentation to create with mycelium a alternative seafood product. So it's fish-free fish, and they're making it very minimally processed through fermentation that Anne and her team are working on. And I think that's so important because if you look at, you know, plant-based meat right now is a tiny little fraction of the total meat market, as you pointed out at the beginning of the show, Matt. But plant-based seafood is a tiny, tiny little portion of the plant-based meat market. You know, less than 2% of plant-based meat is seafood related. So I'm excited that companies like Aquacultured Foods are seeking to to mimic the seafood experience because we're emptying our oceans and we're waging a war on the oceanic life on our planet. And it's a war that was unprovoked and it's unrelenting and we need to create alternatives to help save our seas and help uh, give these fish and crabs and octopuses and other animals who call the ocean home a little bit of a break from our unrelenting assault on them. And so I'm excited about that and I hope to see more alternative seafood companies popping up as well. Love it. Alternative seafood from mycelium. That Yeah, I need to know more about this. That sounds great. Thanks, Paul. And Alison, uh, anything out there at the moment that really excites you other than chicken in the woods? <laughs> I am very excited by lab-grown meat, has to be said. I remember that about 10 to 15 years ago, a friend of mine asked, another friend of mine and me, would we eat lab-grown meat? And my friend said, no, she wouldn't. And I was upset by her answer and couldn't understand it at all because even then I thought why not if meat is meat but lab grown it's meat and I think if people can make meat real real proper steaks real proper chicken and pork in the lab that might be the answer to everything for me personally but it's a long way to go but I'm very excited to see what this space has to offer Great. Yeah, thank you. I know there's loads of investment going into lab grown meat and I'm, I'm kind of with you on that. I mean, if, you know, if you want to eat meat, then this is definitely a cleaner way to do it for sure, I think. But uh, interested to see where the future holds. One final question, if you allow me. So we started big and hopefully we'll, we'll finish big. Um, so if you could make one traditional meat product totally
totally disappear from the world today and replace it with yours, what would it be and why? Alison. Chicken nuggets with a chicken of the woods mushroom. Nice. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Paul? I'm going to concur with Allison here, and I'll tell you why. So I'm indifferent as to how it's made. I, a chicken of the woods sounds great, but maybe there's other ways to make chicken nuggets without chickens too. But, you know, if you look at the animals who go through slaughter plants, nine out of 10 of them are chickens. And so this is a species of animal that is so widely exploited that it really just connotes jokes when you even try to talk about the fact that these birds might have interests that matter. We do that to make ourselves feel better about our despicable treatment of these animals. And so, you know, if you look at how chickens are actually raised, it's pretty unspeakable. People don't want to hear about it because we treat these birds really deplorably. So I would love to see these birds get a break. There's billions and billions and billions of them who we are subjecting to really horrible treatment on factory farms and then in slaughter plants. And if we could find a way to replace the need for all those those birds by doing things, whether it be chicken of the woods or other mycoproteins or really any other animal-free technology, actually, I would be overjoyed. Thanks, Paul. What a very worthy way to finish. That's a really, really nice wrap up. Thank you. And, you know, it, this is a topic which is really close to my heart and I, I love talking about it. So it's been a total pleasure having you both on. And I just, your, both your products are just super interesting, it's super exciting. So thank you very much for that. And where can our listeners go to find out more information about what you do? Paul. Uh, I'd love to, for anybody to get in touch with me. Our website is bettermeat.co. Again, that's bettermeat.co. And you can buy my book, Clean Meat, anywhere books are sold. But if you want to go to the official website, it's just cleanmeat.com. Thank you very much, Paul. And Alison? Say so we have a website, walding-foods.com. There is some information there. You can also contact me directly if you want. You will find me at hello at walding-foods.com. I'm very happy to chat to anyone who wants to chat about this. And hopefully you'll be able to buy our products very soon as well. Amazing. Thank you so much, Alison. So that just leaves me to say a big, no, huge thank you to Paul and Alison. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for listening in. This has been the Food Fight podcast. As ever, if you'd like to find out more, head over to the EIT Food website at www.eitfood.eu. And please also join the conversation via hashtag EIT Food Fight on our Twitter channel at EIT Food. And if you haven't already, please hit the follow button so you never miss an episode. That's it for now. See you all next time. <laughs>